explain software for um, answering your questions that you have during lecture. Um, what we found on Thursday was that there were a number of questions that were completely out of scope. Um, there was questions that were related to the homework assignments. Um, and for those questions, what we're going to say is um, the Q&A during class is not for assignments or for administrative things like when are TA office hours. Those are things that are good for the discussion forum or for talking with us after class. There's a number of TAs that are in lecture and they are here after class um, for answering those questions. We're going to try, in order to really keep things on track, we're going to, you know, the class time is really about asking questions related to the lecture. So um, again, the, um, the, uh, the bit.ly link for the poll for that is up on the boards. It's right here. It's also uh, listed in Canvas under getting help. Um, so that's where you can go. Again, type in your questions. Dr. Parker is moderating those, and she will interrupt me throughout lecture to make sure that the questions that you guys have um, are answered when it's related to course or to lecture content. Were there any questions so far? Great. All right, so let's do a quick recap. What did we talk about last Thursday? Um, we went into some just nitty-gritty overview of uh, review of Java basics. We talked about um, really basic things like um, uh, what, what does it mean, what is, what is a variable, um, that it's a piece of data in memory that has both a name and a type associated with it. We talked a lot about different kinds of types, um, which are the basic building blocks of all programming languages like Java and others, um, and they define what kinds of operations can be performed on that piece of memory. Um, Java has eight different types of primitives. Um, we talked a little bit about different kinds of conversions. We have widening conversions, which are things going from short to int, int to long, int to float, and so on. These are where you're allocating more memory to store that piece of data. There's also narrowing conversions, which are the ones you really need to be careful about. Um, and these are where you're reducing the amount, of, um, the amount of information that's being stored. We can go from a double to a float or a float to an int for example. Um, quick question, uh, quick thing, so just in your head, take 20 seconds. Um, using um, proper order of operations, think about what answer you expect to come out of this equation. Anyone have a, anyone want to give an answer? 9.0. 9 9 any other um, suggestions? 8. 8. Any other, any other answers that people got? Okay, answer is 9.0, okay? Um, so, so we work from, we work from left, <coughs> yes? Go ahead, answer this and then I have a good question. Okay, great. So, um, so, so if, if, What's the, f okay, so if we look at this equation, what's the very first uh, thing that we do here? What's the first operation we're going to do? Five divided by two. Five divided by two, and what comes out of that? An int. An int, and what's that answer? Two. Two, okay. So now, now we have a two there. Now what operation comes next? Times three. Times 3.0, right? So two times 3.0, and what do you get out of that? Six. Six .0. 6.0, right. Okay, and then what comes next? Exactly, we divide the 10 by 3, and what comes out of that? 3. And then what's the final operation? In the back, yeah? 6.0 plus 3. 6.0 plus 3, which gives us 9.0. Exactly. So a related question is, what is the difference in a class and the type? Great. So, um, so a, a class is something that uh, you guys define. So you guys get to define what is included in a class. And a class is more than just storing data. It's also about methods and functions. Okay. So in a class structure, you can have um, variables as well as different methods that are called. Whereas a type is simply just um, a piece of memory that um, is defined to be of a certain type, such as float, double, which says what kinds of uh, arithmetic and operations can you do on it. Does that clarify that? Any other questions? Good, okay. Okay, one more really quick. Take 30 seconds and do this in your head. Anyone have an answer? 
Oh, I, I, wouldn't it be six plus two equals nine as a string? Anyone get anything else? <coughs> six plus three equals 63, that's right. So remember, um, order of operations, the, the plus is what? In this case, after the six plus three in double quotes, what is the plus operator here? Anyone? Yeah. Concatenation. String concatenation. Right, exactly. So we do the quote unquote six plus three equals string concat with a six. But then we have another string, and so that next plus sign is also a string concatenation, which gives us a three, which is how we get this answer. All right, um, lots of examples in the slides from last time. All right, so we also talked a little bit about control flow, which determines how your programs make decisions about what to do and how many times to do it. There's decision making, looping, jumping, and exceptions. We covered all of that. Um, then we also talked about non-primitive types, um, which we call reference types. Um, this is also uh, where we get to, uh, to things like classes. So a reference or a class is a variable that stores the memory address, um, or is, sorry, uh, a reference is a variable that stores the memory address where an object or a group of values resides. So we spent a lot of time um, with this point example. So let's say I have a class called points. Um, so I uh, declare three uh, points, P1, P2, and P3. I then initialize P1 by using our new operator, and I say new point, and I give it some values. Um, and so when I very, when I, that very first de de uh, declarative statement, when I say point P1, P2, and P3, what, what gets stored in those boxes for P1, P2, and P3? After that first line of code. No, right? So, so for reference types, when things are declared without being initialized, they're automatically given the value <coughs> null. For other types of, um, for other types, what gets if you declare it without initializing, what gets stored there? Someone who hasn't answered a question yet. Yeah. Zero. Zero or the equivalent of zero. Yes. Okay. Great. So the second line of code now we say p1 is equal to new point with some with some values. Now, um, what we do is that actual point instance um, is instantiated and it's storing those values and our P1 reference type is actually storing now a memory location that points to where that memory is being stored. So then when I say P1 is equal to P2, um, I'm not actually copying that data. All I'm copying is what's stored in that reference type, which is an address. So that's why now P2 gets the same address as P1. All right. So went over that in a lot of gory detail in the coding example on Thursday. Um, we talked a little bit about parameter passing as well. So Java uses call by value parameter passing, which means a copy is created. So um, we looked at the simple example. If I have, um, I declare and initialize an integer value i, I send it into a function that's called modify an integer, modify the integer, um, and then I print it out. Um, do I expect to print out four or something else? Anyone have a thought? Remember this one? How many of you think I print out four? How many of you think I print out something other than four? Okay, great. So majority wins here. So it is four. Anyone want to explain why? What happens here? Yeah. Um, so when the method modifies i, it's making a new copy of i and modifying that. <coughs> Prints it, it's printing the unmodified version of i. Exactly. It's actually copying the value that's stored in i, and because i is just a basic um, primitive type, it's actually copying that value for and then modifying that. All right. And so this is different when we talk about references, right? And so when we pass a reference, what are we actually passing into a, into a method? What gets passed? The address of where the data is. The address, exactly. So now, if I create a point and I pass it into my modified points and I do something to it and I print and I print out um, the contents of that point, I should expect those contents to actually be different because I passed in the address. So, uh, so whatever that address is pointing to is what's being modified and the address is unmodified. Okay, we talked very briefly about arrays, which is a mechanism for storing a collection of identically typed objects. Um, and so in Java, arrays behave like an object. Um, and we use the, the bracket operator in order to index into those arrays. Um, by default, all array elements are initialized to be zero for primitive types and null for all reference types. Um, so we talked about different ways of initializing that array. Um, in, in the first line, when we're just indicating how the size of the array, all those values are getting initialized as null. 
And in the second one, I'm actually um, initializing with the values, so um, I'm both declaring the size of the array as well as giving values to those elements. Um, array list, which is um, a class from the collections library that you will <coughs> use a lot this semester. Um, and instead of using the bracket operators now, you have a get and a set method in order to access the elements in that array. Um, the add method is going to increase the size by one and add a new item, which is great. You don't have to deal with resizing your array anymore. Um, but the caveat is that array list can only be used with reference types. All right, so that was last week, which was a review, and that was a review of a review. Um, today, we're going to talk about inheritance, polymorphism, um, abstract classes, and interfaces. Um, and then in the class, Dr. Parker is going to do um, a brief coding um, demo to, uh, to push on some of these concepts. So again, I'm going to go over this pretty quick because this is really just meant to be a quick refresher and review. It's not meant to be teaching you these concepts for the first time. I promise, starting next week, lectures are going to slow down a bunch, and I also think they're going to get a lot more interesting. All right, so let's um, remind ourselves what we mean by object-oriented programming. Um, so in object-oriented programming, data is treated as encapsulated in objects, right? Okay, so this is objects or our notion of classes. So objects contain data and define functions that are meaningful to that data. And note here, I'm using the word object with a lowercase o, not to be confused with Java's uppercase o object, which we'll talk about here in a little bit. Objects are instantiations of classes, okay? So in, uh, an actual written piece of code, um, which is, uh, or classes are an actual piece of code that um, are, um, which is used to define the, the behavior of any class. Um, Okay, so um, a class is a very general concept, while an object is a very specific embodiment of that class. <coughs> all right, so um, by using objects and object-oriented programming, we can do all these really awesome things. The reason it came about is to be able to support modularity, code reuse, and better code design. Um, inheritance is a concept that's one of the most powerful things about object-oriented programming. Um, it allows a class to inherit properties from another class. Um, it's used when multiple types of data are going to have something in common, and it allows us to avoid duplication of code, um, which is really great for um, debugging as well as being able to extend the functionality of your code. So um, let's look at a quick example that we'll talk about throughout the class today. So let's say I have a class called a shape. All right. So a shape is a fairly generic kind of idea. Um, a shape, our shape is going to have fields, it's in, um, for the purposes of this we're going to have two fields. We're going to have a color and we're going to have an area. So the color we're just going to define as a string for now and the area we're going to define as a double. But when I talk about a shape, what, a, what does that mean? I can talk about more specific shapes. I can talk about circles, triangles, rectangles, and squares. So let's say our sort of brute force, you know, let's say we wanted to write a program that would um, be able to work with different kinds of shapes. Um, the, the sort of brute force option one would be to write a separate class for each one of our shapes. So here I have an example of that where I define a class triangle and I store a string color and a double area. I have a class circle and I store a string color and a double area. I have a class rectangle and I store a, oh, yeah, I see some people yawning. I totally get it, right? Okay, so you, you get this point. Um, but what if I decide, okay, storing color as a string, if I actually want to do some computation, may not be the best thing. What if instead I want to define it by an integer array of RGB values? Okay? What do I have to do to this? You change them all individually. I go in for each one of these classes, and I have to change my string to a, an array and, and do it for each one, right? That's that uh, seems like some wasted effort, and also, even worse, um, potentially can add in bugs into your code. Um, and what if I want to give each shape an outline color? Now I have to go in and add yet another um, variable to each one of my classes. So, what can I do instead? What's my option? Is there anything to do? Yeah? Create an interface shape. Okay, so we're going to talk about interfaces in a little bit, but before we even get to interfaces, what, what can we do? You can have a super class. I can have a base class, right? Okay, so I can use the word extends, all right? Everyone remember the word extends? Great. All right, so here we go. 
So here's option number two. Now what I do is I define a base class or a super class called shape. And in that class, I can say, OK, all shapes are going to have two things. They're going to have color, and they're going to have an area. So I can define that in the base class. And now what I can do is I can create my individual specific shapes by extending the shape class. I can say triangle extends shape, circle extends shape, rectangle extends shape, square extends rectangle. Am I allowed to do that last one? Yes. Right. Great. OK. So. And the point is, is that when I use this um, extends keyword, um, each one of these um, more specific classes is going to inherit all the public fields, um, public and actually I should say protected fields and methods of that shape class. Okay? So everything that goes in shape, all the more specific shapes also get. Great. So now, if I decide I wanted to change my color from being stored as a string to, an, uh, uh, to a um, set of integers, all I have to do is modify how that's stored in the base class. Okay, right, base class, or we can refer to it as a super class. So here's a diagram because I love visual things. So again, I have my shape class. Um, I see that triangle, circle, and rectangle all extend the shape class directly, and that I've said that my square extends my rectangle class. Okay, so that's where we're at with our example. We're good? Great. Okay, so now that we have a couple of different shape classes, all with the common, um, common fields associated with every single one of those shapes. But, okay, not all shapes are created equal. So circles might, you know, they have, they're going to have something, maybe a radius. Rectangles are going to have a width and a height, and maybe a triangle is going to be defined by three points. Okay, so now all of a sudden I have some things that are different between these. So then what do, what do I do with this information? Do I put radius in my shape class and width and height and points? Do all those go in the shape class? OK. Um, oh, Wi-Fi. Come on. Let's see. This is a cool question. Um, so, hmm. Let me just go back and try this again. seen a question on your um, browser that says, what type is S2 treated as? How many of you are just trying to load the web page? Like me. Okay. Um, I will say that one of your classmates in here is also on the IT department's team and is here to debug. Um, but um, Mitchell, if you're here, it's not working. Uh, Okay, so it looks like about half of you are at least getting online. Unfortunately, you're not getting, I can't get online on my computer, so I can't actually get this question. Um, let me try, I'm going to just try it this way. So at least we can. All right, so at least for those of you, okay, so sorry to be so disruptive. For, so for those of you that can actually, um, can actually get on your phone. The question should have just changed. Okay, so, all right, just as a reminder, what we were talking about is we're talking about um, this problem that now I identify these unique things about each one of my shapes. And so, does it make sense for, for my shape base class to contain things like a radius and width of height? So, the question for you is can inherited classes have their own fields and methods? Yes or no? How many of you have been able to answer this? How many of you are still trying to resolve the website? OK. All right. Well, let's look at the answers. So 96% of you, 97% of you, which I assume is all but one person, said yes, and one person said no. And the answer is yes. Right. So the point is, is that um, individual uh, inherited classes can have their own unique methods and fields. And this is part of what is the power behind inheritance. 
So now if we go back to our example, <coughs> I have something like this, where I can say my shape-based class is going to have my color and my area, because that's a pretty, those are pretty generic, all shapes are going to have that. But now I can say triangle is going to have three points. Um, I'm going to put my, my radius and my center point in circle. My rectangle is going to have a width and a height. And square, which is inherited from rectangle, what's the difference between a square and a rectangle? Well, a square, the width and the height should be the same. So I can add in um, some sort of checker code to make sure that, in fact, the values that I'm giving into my rectangle base class do, in fact, um, make for a square or not. Okay, so, so the point is here is not only do we get this awesome functionality that we get to inherit from a base class so that reduces our work and chances of errors, um, but then we can also have the unique things reside in just those inherited classes. And those inherited classes can be base classes themselves. Um, eh, okay. So another uh, question. Let's go back. Okay. So question is, um, in this example, how many fields does a triangle have? Okay, can you guys see that okay? Let me make this bigger. So how many fields does a triangle have? <coughs> Alright. Okay, so majority of you, oh geez, look at this. I can lock it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm getting better. I'm gonna, I'm gonna figure out how to, how to do this right. Okay, so the answer is in fact five, okay? So why is it five and not three? Anyone wanna explain? Yeah. Um, because as well as the three points it gives to the triangle, it gives the two points, the two fields inherited from the shape class. Exactly, don't forget those two fields that it inherited from shape. Great. All right, so then the next question was, um, how, in this example, how many fields does square get? Um, oh, sorry, I'm sorry, I got to make it active. There we go. Okay. How many fields does a square have? Lock. Okay. Answer is, in fact, four, okay? So most of you got that right. Again, so now square is inheriting its fields from both rectangle and shape. So it gets everything in rectangle and everything in shape, which equals four. We doing okay? Yeah, I just want to say there, there is a question about parameter passing that we're going to answer in the code demo. So I am purposely ignoring something for later, but there have been no new questions. All right, so, um, okay, so we were just talking about inherited classes and base classes with respect to fields, but everything we just talked about also applies to methods. So um, any sort of method that I put in a shape in, the, in my base class gets inherited by any class that extends that. So in this example now, in shape, I've added the method toString, which just prints out um, my, the color plus shape. So it prints out I make red shape or a blue shape or so on. Okay, so now I go down to, um, and I, I instantiate a triangle, and it, again, triangle extended shape, and I say, um, I set the color to red, and I call the print line to string. What gets printed here? What, what's gonna print out? Red shape. Red shape, very good, great. Okay, so what can and can't inherited classes do? So. Um, a derived class can add new fields and new methods. What it cannot do is remove fields, remove methods, inherit private fields, or inherit private methods. Okay? So if I put anything private in those shape in that base class, for example, in shape, my the classes that extended can't actually um, don't, they don't actually have access to anything that's considered private. All right, so let's talk about overriding a method. Okay. So the ability of a class to override a method allows a class to inherit from a base class whose behavior is eh, close enough and then modify that behavior as needed. However, with the one caveat that the, the method has, has to have the same signature, which means it has to have the same name, parameters, and return type. So an example of this would be, let's say in my circle class, which again extends shape, 
I'm now going to override this two-string method. I, so I defined two-string in the shape class, but now I'm going to override it. Um, and that um, function is going to, instead of um, returning color and then shape, it's going to say, it's going to print out color plus circle with the radius of whatever the radius is. Okay? Why would I override? Exactly. So, so um, maybe there's, there's this um, generic sort of method that I want to be able to give um, the, the world access to, but the details of how I'm actually going to do that for my individual um, extended classes, I want to make different. So, um, right. So in this example, an example you like read my mind is get area. So it makes sense to say with a shape I can get an area, but how I actually compute that area is going to vary based upon what kind of shape I actually have. So um, we can also do what's called partial overriding, where derived classes can explicitly invoke the base class's version of a method using super. So sometimes I might want to um, um, have part of that method reside in a base class and be shared among all, and sometimes I don't. So for example, um, so here's an example where I say do something and I say super dot do something, and then in the um, inherited class I would write a little something a little bit more. So for example, if I was calling my uh, get area, maybe what I want to do is print out, I'm computing the area. So I can put that in the shape class. And then in my circle class, I could, in my specific get area, I could say super dot get area, and it would print out that statement, and then do the actual computation that's unique for that circle there. Okay? Um, so why would we do this? <coughs> kind of a redundant question. It's basically reuse, 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 re you know, like a recycling motto. Okay, so um, right, so we can reuse things, but it's in the case we want to do something slightly different than the base class, but most of that code is already going to be there for us. Okay, reuse, reduce, recycle. All right, so again, what we've been talking about here with inheritance um, is let's let's just as a quick recap. So option one. So let's say we had no base classes. Um, in this example of using the different shapes, what I was forced to do. Um, if I wanted to have a but if I wanted to have circles and triangles and squares, is that I would have to copy and paste. You know, one thing is I could copy and paste my implementation of circle, modify it slightly for a triangle, rectangle, and square. Problem is, is if I copy and paste a bug, I'm going to have to debug it in every single one of those places. Um, if I want to extend or modify some code, I'm going to have to do that also in each one of those places. And there's also then no inherent relationship between classes. Um, for example, I can't pass a circle to a method that expects a shape. Maybe I just want to have an array list of shapes, um, but without using inheritance, I can't actually do that. Option two, on the other hand, is to use base classes um, and then have other more specific types of classes extend that. So we can write one function that operates on any shape and automatic code reuse through inheritance. So can a child class use a parent class constructor and add fields to it? Great question. Anyone know the answer to that? In the constructor of a child super parentheses, it's the constructor of that Right. So it's, it's so the question though it's not quite well defined, so I'm not exactly sure what you mean, but if you mean can you use the parent's constructor as a call it and then add fields to the child, yes, but you cannot add those, you cannot pass those new fields to super, obviously, because they don't exist for the parent. And that's how you answered the question. That's how I took it too, but I wasn't exactly sure. Um, another question, if C extends B and B extends A, then does calling super in C call the method or constructor in A or B? Oh geez, can you say that one more time? <laughs> or maybe, maybe, maybe you could answer it. So if C extends B and B extends A, so A is a grandparent, B is a parent, C is a child. Yes. Yeah. So you call super and C. Who are you calling? The parent or the grandparent? Wait, is C the grandparent? 
Wait, the hierarchy is A, B, C. And you call super and C, and who's getting called? Okay. Anyone want to take that one? Who hasn't answered a question yet? Yeah. Who gets called, A or B? Who calls it B? Good. What if B also had super? So, so you can cause the, the method in A to be called, but only if B also had super. So you only go up one level. Okay? And then finally, um, is the override decorator required for partial overriding? This is something you had on slide mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh No. No, it's not required. No. It's, it's a good idea, but it is not required. Okay? And, and in your assignment, we encourage you to do it, but it is not required. Great. Okay. So let's look at one um, more quick example of inheritance. Um, so let's suppose you're making a video game that we're going to call Simone versus Simone. Um, I, I don't know how many of you remember watching these ladies two years ago in the Summer Olympics. I was a little bit obsessed as they were like racking up a gazillion medals. Um, so Simone Biles, she's a U.S. gymnast. Simone Manuel was a, um, on the women's swim team, both amazing. So let's say we wanted to make a video game because I think in video games you can choose to be different athletes and do things, or so I'm told. So we're gonna make a video game about these two, about these two athletes. And what we wanna do is we wanna let them compete and see who gets more medals. Um, and so what we could do is we could have, um, let's say we have a base class called I have a sport. And in the sport, I have a way of competing, and I have a way of, through that competition, earning medals. Okay, so I can store my number of medals. So now what I can do is, it turns out that Simone and Simone are in very different kinds of sports, so what it means to compete is different. So I could say, well, let's let gymnastics, gymnastics was one of our more specific sports, so I'm going to extend, I'm going to create a class called gymnastics, and it's going to extend sport. Um, and I'm going to override my compete function and basically I'm going to talk about how you can do an amazing floor routine. Um, and then in my swim class, I'm going to extend sport as well. And here what compete means is swimming freestyle really, really fast. Okay? So without inheritance, what we might have to do in our Simone versus Simone game is we might have to have a, you know, if we wanted to call the appropriate compete, depending upon which athlete I choose to be, um, I'm going to have to have maybe a switch statement like this, where I'm going to have to store a sport type like gymnastics and call my specific function compete in the floor exercise, or if it's swimming, compete in freestyle. But with inheritance, I have this really beautiful thing where I can just say sport, compete, and it doesn't matter um, what I, if I'm a gymnast or a swimmer, it's going to call the right thing because of inheritance. Okay? So this is just a, a, another simple um, example that shows some of the power, um, not just in making sure that you're, comp that you're reusing code, but in this case, also reducing um, the kind of code you have to write in working with those sorts of classes. All right. We're going to go on. Polymorphism. Okay, so let's talk really briefly about type compatibility. So um, a derived class is going to be compatible with its base class. So for example, let's say that um, I write this um, public method called isLarger, and isLarger is going to take sh two shapes, shape one or shape two. And basically what I want to say is I'm going to return true if the area for S1 is larger than the area for S2. So now what I can do is I can, let's say I have two shapes, I have a triangle and a circle, um, and I instantiate each of those. And then I can say, if my triangle is larger than my circle, do something. Okay? So that's our example. So why can I pass is larger both a circle and a triangle? Those are two different classes. Why can I pass it here? Because uh, is larger just takes uh, shape parameters, and they're both shapes. And they're both shapes. And what's in the shape class? So, so, so both a circle and a triangle um, are shapes, and what is in the shape base class that lets me do this function? Yeah. They both have to get area method. They both have to get area method, right. Okay, so 
Polymorphism is just an example, uh, or is just a fancy word for automatically determining an object's type at runtime. So what Java does at runtime is it's going to use the most specific type possible. Okay, so let's say I have this little bit of code. I, again, I have my two shapes, S1, and I, um, I say shape S1 is equal to a new circle, <coughs> and shape S2 is equal to a new triangle. So if I, if I um, say S1 get area and S2 get area, what type is S1 treated as? And my computer will connect, so. Okay, so again, the question is, in this bit of code, um, um, wait, what did I ask? What type is S1 treated as when I call S1.getArea? Is it a circle, a triangle, or a shape? How many of you are not able to get on? Just a few. Okay, great. All right, let's look at what you said. Look. Okay, so two thirds of you said circle, and one third of you said shape. The answer is circle, right? Because Java is going to use the most specific class it can at runtime. And by, in this case, for example, because circle has a get area um, method, it's going to use that as opposed to shape. All right, I think I had another question, right? Nope, not yet. Okay. Great. So, um, so Java, you know, one of, the, one of the things about Java as a programming language is that it really takes um, OO to an extreme. So every single reference type is actually polymorphic because every reference type inherits from object, and here I mean object with a big O, okay? So when you write your own toString or equals methods, you're actually overriding object's version of that. So you're, you're overriding all the time. Right, object with a big O. Okay, so for example, in assignment one, you're working with a matrix class. So I have matrix M, and I um, uh, declare and, and initialize my matrix. And then when I call my m.toString method, this is a form of polymorphism because um, a matrix is also an object, and object has a two-string method as well. But you're going to call the more specific version here, which is the two-string method that you're writing for the assignment. Oh, is polymorphic. Okay. Great. Yes. Yes, it is. OK, so um, here's uh, another example. So let's say now I um, create an array of shapes. And so this is a nice moment for me to mention this is pseudocode. Okay, because why? Why is that first line not like for real code in Java? Oh, never mind. Forget it. Forget I said it. I was thinking the other way around. If I had made this array, okay, sorry, I was remembering array list can only hold reference types. It's not the other way as well. Okay. All right, so I create an array of five shapes and I'm going to initialize those shapes to be a triangle, a circle, a rectangle, and so on. Okay, so then what I'm going to do is I have a function here where I want to compute the total area for all the shapes that I have in my array. So what I can do is I can just um, iterate over each one of those shapes and call um, the getArea function. And that's because getArea exists in this base class, so I know that I can call it. But at runtime, what is Java trying to do? Anyone want to remind us what, I, what does Java do about what it calls? It's going to find the most specific type. And because in each one of my inherited classes, I actually define what it means to get an area, that's the one it's going to call. All right, that's all I was going to say on polymorphism. Um, there is one question. So back to your example, why is S1 treated as a circle when it's declared as a type of shape? Why? In this, in this one, I guess? Why is S1 treated as a yes. circle when it's called a shape? Mm -hmm. um, uh, when I call get area. Actually, let me offer an alternative, alternative explanation. Okay, there's, you see two types in this declaration. You see a type that is on the left side. We call that the compile time type. That is the type that the compiler thinks S1 is. 
And then there is the type that is used to actually instantiate this object. And that is what happens at runtime. So we call the one that you see when you call the constructor, which is usually on the right side, we call them its runtime type. And these types don't have to be the same, but they do have to be what? What's the rule? So it, it doesn't have to be the same thing on each side, but there is a rule. <coughs> They have to be type compatible. So the type that is the runtime type, the one who's, who you use when you call the constructor, has to be below shape in a hierarchy. It doesn't have to be immediately after shape, but shape has to be one of its classes, its base classes, its ancestors in that, in that hierarchy that you draw. Okay? So that's the rule, but other than that, they can be different. And when it comes to calling this method get area, as we've said over and over and over, what Java's going to do is go get the most specific version of get area that it can, which means go see if there's one in circle. Okay? That, hopefully that cleared it up. Any other questions? Um, yeah, and on. <coughs> okay, are both types stored with the object? Uh, that's a little bit tricky. There's a difference between what the compiler does for you and what the Java runtime system is doing for you. So let me just say a general answer is yes, even though that's not quite right, okay, because there's a difference in what the compiler knows and what the runtime system knows. And then just to repeat, the one that is on the left is called the static or compile time type. Static means unchanging. So for the compiler's point of view, s one's always a shape. And we'll get to some of the issues of having S1 be a shape at compile time in our code demo today. And the one that's on the right hand side is the runtime type or the dynamic type. The one that can change. That's what dynamic means. What does polymorphism mean? And I don't mean what does it mean in Java. I just mean as a word. Let's dissect it. What does polymorphism mean? Because you know what I can do with S1 after this code? I can say S1 equals new, what? Rectangle, because rectangle is a shape. So S1's runtime type can change in the program, but its compile time type stays fixed. Static versus dynamic, okay? <coughs> All right, go ahead. All right. Okay, so let's talk, let's go a little bit further in this and talk about abstract classes. So now a class that has one, at least one abstract method is known as an abstract class. And derived methods must, it must um, implement any abstract method. Um, abstract classes cannot be instantiated. Okay? So that means I can't actually say shape S1 equals new shape if it's abstract. Okay. Um, so next question. All right, so um, given this running example we have, um, which of these lines, which of these snippets of code are illegal? Oh my gosh. I just gave that answer. If you were paying attention, I just gave this answer. All right. 21% of you just didn't compute what I had just said 30 seconds before. So um, because we now have an abstract method in our shape class, we can no longer instantiate a shape because we now, we would have a method that has no definition to it. 
Um, so, but we can in fact um, instantiate a new shape as a, as a triangle, assuming that we've um, <coughs> defined what get area means in triangle. All right. Okay, so um, abstract classes or, or can only be base classes. That's it. It can only be a base class. All right. There's a lot more questions about polymorphism, but we'll just move into the code demo. Okay. All right, so interfaces. Let's talk about interfaces. So interfaces, um, as someone brought up before, an interface is the ultimate version of an abstract class. Every single method in an interface is abstract. Um, so what's the point of an interface then? What, what, why do we have interfaces? Right, so, so basically what interfaces are, are great for is they're great for letting us know, it's giving us an API, right? It, it's letting, letting us know that there's this common set of things that we can assume for any class that's going to have this type of, that's going to extend from this interface, right? So um, every method is abstract, um, and it can only contain public static final fields. Um, and it's declared with interface instead of actually using the keyword class. So any class that's going to derive from an interface uses the word implements instead of extends. And so that implements then, you can think of it as sort of a form of contract, right? So, so then any sort of derived class that implements an interface says, I can guarantee to you that I'm going to have all, I'm going to have, um, I'm going to make sure that I define what all these methods mean for my class specifically. So subclasses can actually implement multiple interfaces, but you can only ever extend from one base class. Um, right, so okay, so an interface provides a contract that guarantees objects that um, of a certain type can do certain specific things. Um, one type of interface that you um, we're gonna we're gonna talk about is the comparable interface. And the comparable interface has a single method and that's it, and that's called compare to. Um, classes that implement comparable have a natural ordering. Okay, so anything that's going to implement um, comparable would be something that I could order in some way. Um, so it can be sorted without knowing any details about the class, just use the compare to method. So for example, let's say I have a um, class uh, person that's going to implement comparable. So now again, I, instead of using extend, I use implement. And, um, and my person class has a name and it has an age. Okay. So because I've implemented comparable, that means that I have to define a function called compare to. So I override this here in my person class um, definition. So in this case, comparing two people, there's many different ways you could compare people in order to rank them. You could do height, you could do um, zip code, you could do a whole bunch of things. In this case, we're going to do age. So inside of my compare to, um, it's going to return um, uh, if, two, if, a, if the two people have the same age, so if the this has the same age as the person I'm comparing to, I return a zero. So in comparable, zero means equal. Um, and minus one means that that person is less than, and uh, positive one means that person is greater than. So then if I'm not equal, I say else return, um, if this age is greater than the, the, my compared to person, return one, otherwise return minus one. So I've, done, I've used something here called the ternary operator. How many of you are familiar with this shorthand version of if then else? Okay, so it's just a shorthand um, in Java that you can use that basically says you give it um, you give it some sort of um, 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 oh my gosh, what's the word? You give it some sort of uh, boolean conditional. Thank you, conditional. You give it a conditional um, which is this age greater than p dot age. And then the question mark means, you know, so if that, then one, and then the colon means else minus one. Okay, so it's just a shorthand for doing an if then else. So is that first part before the question mark, is that just any Boolean statement? Yeah, any conditional statement, yes. Yep. Okay, so, okay, so again, um, we're, we're talking about implementing this comparable interface. So the way that I would use this, is like, so now let's say I create two people. One of them is Simone Biles, who's age 20, and the other person is um, Simone Manuel, who's age 21. Originally, I had put myself and Dr. Parker in here, but I knew she would object to this. So, um, so now what I can do is 
I can say um, print line, I say P1, who is Simone Giles, <coughs> compared to P2, Simone Manuel. What is going to print out here? Anyone have a thought? What gets printed out? It's going to be an integer. We have a guess. Who hasn't answered yet? Has a guess. Yeah. You think it's going to print out which one? Negative one. Any other thoughts? Okay, so that is in fact correct. It prints out minus one because it's saying it's calling the P1s compare to. So it's comparing P1 to, to P2, and Simone Biles is in fact younger than Simone Manuel. So in our if-then-else statement, it's going to go to the minus one. So that's what gets printed out. And so that's what um, an example of using the comparable interface looks like. Questions on that so far? Not specifically that, and you might get to this, so if you do, please just wait. But why would you use an abstract class over an interface? Good question. Um, I don't get to that. So if we talk about abstract, so, so interfaces are sort of abstract classes taken to the extreme, right? Where you can, um, every single method is an abstract class. So why is that just not considered an abstract class? Well, one thing, if you, if you remember, is that a uh, in, in class can inherit from multiple interfaces, but it can only ever inherit from one base class. So if you have something that's an abstract class, um, something can inherit from it, but it can't inherit from any other base classes, whereas an interface is something that an uh, inherited class can have multiple, can inherit from multiple interfaces. Does that answer the question? Well, also, there's the advantage in an abstract class, you can have some implementation. If, if your implementation makes sense at the base, it's not going to get more specific down the inheritance hierarchy. Code reuse says put it as high as you can, and an interface doesn't allow it. Okay, good question. All right, so um, that's it for this part. Um, I just want to say, so um, the reading for Thursday, so Thursday is our last review day. Um, and in fact, we're going to be talking about generics, which my understanding is that you've heard about a little bit but don't have a ton of experience with. We're going to be using generics heavily in this class. So we're going to do a refresher um, of what generics are. I encourage you to look at this Java notes. Um, um, web web uh, um, web page that we have. Um, don't forget, assignment one is due um, Friday at at. Hey, I, we're not done talking up here. So assignment one is due Friday at 5 p.m. Again, this is a solo assignment, so you have to complete this on your own. Um, and the academic policy acknowledgement is due on Thursday evening. Okay. So what we're going to do, we're going to transition. Dr. Parker is going to do um, a code demo. We're going to take about uh, a five-minute break right now. So um, Less you, than five minutes. So just a few minutes. A as few soon minutes. as we get set up, I'm going to get started. Okay. Let's, let's try to connect this. See if we can connect better. First, we'll have a, That's not why we're taking the break. We're just taking the break to change presenters. This is material that you need to stay for. Okay. 
Um, so the question about parameter passing came up again um, in, the, uh, in the moderated questions. So um, this is the question. We have this modified int example on the slides. We've seen that before. Okay, we know what's going to happen. But the question is, what if you pass the wrapper class version instead? Okay, so you'll notice we have modify int and int i, and, and I've modified it with a plus plus. And now we have modify integer. I'm passing the wrapper class for int. And I do the same thing, and I say i plus plus. And I think this is a, was a very good question. This is why I wrote this code on the fly. I did want to give you a hint, though. Remember how we use wrapper classes. There's auto boxing and auto unboxing. And it has happened automatically for you with the compiler. So as a programmer, we forget that that is happening. So auto boxing is happening here. When I say make an integer, which is a reference type, y, and I set it equal to 4, which is a primitive type. I didn't write the equivalent code here for you, but does anyone know what this is? Integer y equals, what does the compiler insert for you? New integer parenthesis 4. Parenthesis 4. It actually calls the constructor for the integer wrapper class and it passes 4 as the int that you're wrapping, right? Okay, it's being done for you automatically, so we don't see it here and we don't see a compiler error. The part that's important for this question is the auto unboxing that's happening. So I++ plus plus is the same as get the int, the little int value out of the integer. I have to put that somewhere, so I put it into an int z, and then z++. Plus plus. Okay. So we know what's going to happen here. We definitely print 4 because calling the method gives us a copy of the primitive, so changing that copy does not change the original primitive. But what about here? What are we going to print? Someone that I know hasn't answered a question today. Four. Four. Why? Because we, we didn't change anything about what was stored in I, did we? We had to take that integer out to change it. There was no way to say, hey, increment the int that's inside of that integer. I had to pull the int out and increment it myself. And then if I want to update I, the only way to do it is what? Josh, you want to say what you said before? Oh, no. <laughs> Good, Z. We'll do Z in this case, right? Um, oh, well, actually, I guess we can't say Z directly. So Z's value, which would be 5 here. And you'll notice I'm making an entirely new integer with an entirely new address. This method has no way of changing that integer. Okay. So. That's the answer to that question. It was a pretty good one. It, it's a subtle thing about parameter passing that even though we went over this a lot last time, we, we still didn't get to. Okay? So let me just say one more time, you guys are posting questions um, to, the, to the thing that I'm moderating. A lot of them can be answered by writing your own code examples. This is an example of something that could have been answered yourself by just doing this. But it was a good enough example getting to some of the subtleties of parameter passing that I wanted to do it. There are other questions you're asking I'm ignoring because you can answer them yourself. Okay, and you need to. You need to get in that habit. I now want to move on to what we're really going to talk about today, which is polymorphism. And I'm going to work in some of the questions that got posted right as we were ending. Okay, so I'm going to try and answer some of those questions about polymorphism with my example. So we have a very simple hierarchy built. I just want to give you an idea of what this picture means. So object is a class we, of course, did not build. That's already in Java. It has more methods than just equals and two string, but equals and two strings are the ones that we override the most. Okay? So it's colored a little differently because I didn't write that class, but every class is derived from object. I did write a parent class. Okay? So this parent class extends object. We don't say extends object because that happens automatically. And what I did was I overrode the equals method. I don't have the override decorator, but I know I'm overriding it because there's a tiny green triangle over here that says I am. Okay? So I'm not doing anything interesting. I'm just going to print a message. 
this message is going to be useful to us to know when we call equals, whose equals is it? So if it prints this, it's the equals in parent. And you can see I have a little clue for us visually. Parent comes from object, and it has its own equals method. And that's all it has. Okay? Then we have child. Child extends parent. This, of course, explicitly has to be said. And it overrides to string. I know that's an override. I see another green triangle over here. And it provides its own new method called bar. Okay? And again, visually, our reminder is there for child. Finally, grandchild also has its own equals method. Okay? So, here are the questions that I have for you. This is just another reminder that parent defines these methods and so on and so on. But I'm going to scroll up because I think the picture is most useful here. So here's our first question. We're going to try this as a poll. Your poll will have um, choices A through E. Sometimes we don't need all the way to E, so use that accordingly. Here's your first question. I have purposely left this commented, but I want to know what happens when I say grandchild G equals a new child. Is it A, a compiler error? B, an exception at runtime, or C, no error. So please give your answer. We're going to run through this pretty quickly, so if we miss your response, that's okay. I mean, whenever you think you've got enough responses. Okay, let's call it. What's the most popular answer? A. A. 50% says compiler error. What if I'm even unsure what's going to happen? What should I do? Uncomment the code, right? Uncomment the code. And we see the red underline. It is a compiler error. Why can I not say grandchild G equals a new child? Um, since grandchild is lower on the hierarchy, yeah. uh, we can't do that. Because, because you could have added things to grandchild that aren't part of child. We're good. We're going the wrong direction in the hierarchy, right? Based on what I said earlier. So what's on the left side has to be the same as or above in the hierarchy what's on the right side, okay? And it's not, so it violates that rule. So I'm going to comment that back so that we can go to our next question. So this is the one we're on now. Same choices for your answers. When I say object O equals a new parent, is it A, a compiler error, B, an exception at runtime, or C, no error? Overwhelmingly see no error, no compiler error. I could run this code and notice that no exception happens. I won't to save time. And you're right, there's no error. This is going the correct direction in the hierarchy. You can do this. Okay? So let's go to this question right here. So now you've got choices. Oh, actually, this should just be D. We don't need an E, so let me change that to D. I've taken out a choice at some point. Um, so what happens right here? Which version of the equals method is called on O? So it could be A object, B parent, C grandchild, or D. Maybe it's a compiler error. Notice I have it commented, so you can't see if it's a compiler error or not. Okay. 80% B, it comes from parent. Okay, good, it's not a compiler error, but what do I now need to do to know if it comes from parent? Run it. What did we put in parents equals method? We put just a little printout message. They'll say, hey, from parent, this is me. So let's give it a try. Oh, good, it is from parent. Okay, so that is correct. And the reason is, well, there's two things that happened here. Number one, why did it compile? I mean, I, I did specifically comment the code and ask you with the possibility being that it might not compile. So why did it compile? What is the compiler going to check? To give you thumbs up or thumbs down? Whether or not there's actually an object in the variable of. Whether or not there's an equals method in something type object. That's all it cares. It doesn't care which one you call. It just says, okay, there'll be something to call, so I'm okay with this. All right? So, yes, there's an equals method in object. We know that. 
Then the question becomes, ah, but which one will really be called? And what we've said over and over today is the most specific version will be called. And so if we look down that hierarchy, at runtime, O is really a parent. And there is a more specific version of equals and parent. So that is the one that will be called. So it's the compiler's job to make sure there will be a method for you to call at runtime. It doesn't decide which one. At runtime, which one is decided? And the rule is the most specific one is the one that will be called. Grandchild also has an equals. That looks even more specific. It's further down the hierarchy. But O is not a grandparent. O is just a parent. So you can't go further than that. Okay? All right, next one. We're right here. Which version of two string is called on O? Your choices are A object, B child, or C, it's a compiler error. Eighty percent A. So it does compile, and if we run it, I'm going to recomment the other so we don't get two printouts. Nothing printed. The, the console didn't pop up for me in Eclipse. That means nothing printed. So it must come from object because. I didn't write that to string method. There's no message there. Okay? And it came from object because, again, we are a parent at runtime. There's no to string in parent. We look up the hierarchy. The most specific one is the one from object. Okay. Now we have this example. I've already made an O2 whose compile time type is object and whose runtime type is child. So the question is this, which version of the equals method is called on O2? A object, B parent, C grandchild, or D none? It is a compiler error. Eighty percent B. Again, it's not a compiler error for the same reason the last one wasn't. Object has an equals method, so the compiler knows there's something you can call, but the question is, which one will actually be called, and we see that it is the equals method from parent. So once again, we look down the hierarchy. At runtime, child is what we have. But child doesn't have its own equals method, so then we begin looking up. And the next one that does have an equals method is parent. That's the one we go with. Okay? All right, now we're on to this one. So we make a parent P that at runtime is a child, and the question is, when I say p.bar, which version of the bar method is called? And you only have two choices here. Either it's bar from child, or b, it doesn't compile. No one else has a child. Sorry, no one else has a bar method from child. 75% a. 75% a, OK. Let's uncomment it. And observe the compiler error. Why isn't this compiling? What is the compiler's job? It is not the compiler's job to pick which method you're going to call, but to ensure that the uh, parent object class has a two-bar. That the static type that's on the left side actually has a bar to call. And parent doesn't have a bar. You look at parent, you don't see bar. You can keep going up the hierarchy. Even the compiler is going to go up and say, well, maybe there's one in object. And we know there's not. So the compiler says, no, you said you were a parent, and I cannot find a bar method. You can't do this. Okay? Remember the compiler's job. It's not its job to say, well, at runtime, you might be a child, and child has one. No. Okay? So you cannot get past the compiler on this one. All right. Here we are with a child C, which we make a new grandchild. And the question is, which version of equals will be called on C? A, the version from object. B, the version from parent. C, the version from grandchild. Or D, it's a compiler error. Seventy-five percent C. Seventy-five percent C. It is definitely not a compiler error. Everything has an equals method. But which one will we call? Let's run it. And we have equals from grandchild. So. Grandchild is the most specific. It has its own equals. There you are. That's the one that will be called. Okay. Now, to answer some of the questions that were posted during the lecture, um, so one of them I had time to type out an example. I didn't have a time to type out choices, so we'll stop the polling. 
But here was the question. I mentioned just very quickly when we were looking at the slide that we had shape S1 is equals new circle. And I was explaining the difference in those two types. And then I, I said that the compile time type, which is the one on the left side, cannot change. Okay, so in this case, we have object O. But during execution of the program, O's runtime type can change. It's dynamic. That means changing. So I have tried to change it right here. O equals a new child. So can we do this? Yes. Yes. Let's uncomment it and notice there's no compiler error here. You can do this. So a question that was posted is, what happens to the original new parent? So you've replaced what O was pointing to, which was a new parent, with now a new child. What happens to that old new parent? Does it go to the garbage collector? The garbage collector picks it up. And you don't, you don't need to know, know what the garbage collector, oh my gosh, if you've never heard that, that's okay. It just means it gets deleted in memory, right? Okay. And you didn't have to do it. It just happened. That was nice. Okay. Here's another question. Why would I ever want to do that? <laughs> Why would I want to say, oh... I'm watching this clock right here that says two minutes. When I'm watching O and I say O is a new parent, and then later in the program I say O is a new child, why would you even do that? This seems confusing, so there must be a reason why we can do it. Yes. I, the reason that I have these methods being redefined down the hierarchy is they mean different things for different types, and I always want to use the most specific one. So later I want the one from that is more specific and later on the hierarchy. Okay. So there is a good reason to do this. Here was another good question that was posted. Does typecasting, so I, I think what was meant was the explicit typecasting that can happen um, in parentheses, does that change the runtime type of an object or just what the compiler thinks the type is? Does anyone know the answer to that? So I could say something like O is a new child casted to a parent. This is all compiles because all the types are, they are all um, compatible with each other. So O, does it become a parent really? Or just for the compiler's point of view? It's just the compiler's point of view. Okay. So that typecasting is just so that you can pass some, through some compiler rules that you weren't passing without the casting. In general, it's a really bad idea. If you find you're having to do this, you need to go back to the drawing board. You should have done something differently to begin with. So avoid all typecasting for classes. It's very bad. It's a, it's, a, it's a real rabbit hole. You don't want to go down. And then finally, one more really good question was this. So let's suppose that I make a method, let's say foo, to take an object, A, Let's make it a little a, and it does something with that, okay? Um, and then from here, let's say I, what I pass to foo is c. Notice that c above there is a, is a child. So c's compile time type is child, and then I've called foo, and foo's parameter type is object. So the question is this. Is what I've passed to foo a child, or is it an object? And I think there's two parts to this answer. So not you, but next to you, who I haven't heard from. Uh, in the child, they will build up until it gets something that can work with. What are the two parts to this answer? OK, well, that's the reason why it's compatible. So I can do this. If I, if I finished all the code, I can do this. Remember, there's the runtime type and the compile time type. It is going to be a reference to a child <coughs> at runtime, but when it comes to compile time checks within foo, what type is it going to use? Object. So if you put anything inside of foo that just works for child and isn't an object, you're going to get compiler errors here. So it is still a child at runtime when you actually pass that argument, but for the compiler, it's going to check all of this code in the dot 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 with A as an object. So there still are these two types that exist. 
okay? And it's what you've actually said in the code as the type, not as the new, let me call the, com the constructor, but as the type that the compiler is going to use. This code will be posted for you to experiment with and answer all of your own questions. We'll see you Thursday.